Okay, one of my favorite questions to ask my students when we talk about the topics of protein is, what is a protein? And what I like to do as a teacher is, I ask them this question, I take a step back and let them answer it. Uh, more often than not, I'll get answers like, oh, proteins are basically uh, things or food that we need for our body. They would give vague answers like, oh, we need proteins to build muscles. We need proteins to be healthy. We need proteins to build new cells, to grow, to repair tissues. These were all the things they were taught about proteins when they were studying things uh, during their GCSE, O-levels, IGCSE, or, you know, any levels before A-levels, right? And for the most part, they are correct. My students will be right. And if I ask them, so give me examples of proteins then. And they will say eggs, salmon, chicken. Chicken is quite popular. Uh, some students will say tofu, nuts. Um, so all these things actually do contain proteins. But it still doesn't answer the question, how exactly does proteins work? Uh, what exactly are they made out of? Why are they useful? In what specific way do we as humans need proteins. And not just humans. Uh, we also have to ask ourselves the question, uh, do other organisms in this world also need proteins? The answer is yes. Every living organism on earth, from the smallest bacteria to the largest plant or uh, mammal, we can call it blue whale, okay, um, will need proteins to survive. Now, why do they need proteins to survive is an extremely difficult question to answer because proteins have many functions. But before we dive into the importance of proteins and what they are made out of, let's do a little bit of revision. Uh, you might have seen this in your GCSE or O levels. And if you haven't, uh, this will give you an idea of how proteins work. When you have a leaf over here and the leaf takes in three molecules. They have to take in carbon dioxide, they have to take in nitrate ions, and they also have to take in water. And when they undergo photosynthesis, they will then be able to produce these very small molecules. I'm just going to symbolize the small molecules in um, triangles, circles, and squares. These are just small molecules. They don't look exactly like that. This is just a symbol. Um, and these small little molecules are basically known as amino acids. So once the plants make amino acids, the plants will join the amino acids together to make them into proteins. And how they join it together, we are going to look at it in the next video. But for now, when you join amino acids together, small molecules, you make them into a large molecule known as a protein. Why do plants make proteins? Plants make proteins for various reasons. They may need it for to grow. They may need this protein for to function as an enzyme. They may, may, they may need this protein to function as a hormone. There can be various functions to it. Now, without wasting any time, here comes a caterpillar, and the caterpillar eats the plant proteins. And when the caterpillar eats the plant proteins, the plant proteins then enter the caterpillar's digestive system. And the proteins are then digested back into amino acids and the amino acids then enter the cells of the caterpillar and the caterpillar uses those very amino acids to make something called caterpillar proteins so what we notice here is the caterpillar is breaking down the plant proteins back into amino acids and repurposing it and building it to become a different type of protein that the caterpillar needs Maybe the caterpillar needs proteins to also grow. Maybe the caterpillar needs proteins to produce a certain type of color or pigmentation of its body. So, and if this is like, for example, a silkworm caterpillar, silkworm caterpillars produce proteins called silk, um, which is used to make clothing. And then what happens is a chicken comes along and the whole process starts again. The chicken is happy to see the caterpillar over there. Do not judge the drawing of my chicken. I try my best. <laughs> uh, that's the best I can do. I'm not so good with drawing. Um, and, the cat and, and the same thing happens. The chicken eats the caterpillar and the caterpillar protein enters the hen or the chicken's digestive system. 
the digestive system breaks it down back into amino acids and it's then repurposed into the chicken to make it into uh, chicken protein. Examples of chicken protein will be muscles in the chicken. Uh, here's where we reach somewhere familiar because if you are a non-vegetarian, if you've had chicken before, you know that when you eat the flesh of the chicken, the flesh or the meat of the chicken contains proteins. And when you eat it, which is basically the chicken's protein, you are then taking the protein, it enters your digestive system, you break it down into amino acids, and your body repurposes those amino acids into different types of proteins. For example, uh, you, for example, you may use some of those amino acids to make proteins called enzymes, hormones, or even antibodies. These are some examples of proteins that you may have studied in your O-levels, IGCSEs, or GCSEs. So this just gives us an introduction to what's the relationship between proteins and amino acids. So some of my students, when they look at this, they may think, oh my God, am I part chicken? Uh, well, no, because you're not part chicken. Uh, if you say you're part chicken, you're technically part caterpillar and you're also technically a part of the plant. Uh, but it's not. Life, uh, fundamentally, if we just condense this information, it just basically means the caterpillar takes materials from the plants to make it into a part of its own body. The chicken takes materials from the caterpillar, which makes it a part of its own body. And we take parts of the chicken so that we can make it a part of our body as well. And that's what we do to proteins. In fact, that's what we do to a lot of nutrients, by the way. Uh, but does that mean you're part chicken? No, you're not part chicken. Okay, that's not what it means at all. So don't worry. It, it doesn't, this is not the phrasing. <laughs> so that, this, some of my students will go, aha, is that what they mean by you are what you eat? No. <laughs> well, maybe, maybe that's the origin of the statement, but I don't think that's what they actually meant. In any case, this is just basically the flow or the relationship between chickens, uh, uh, not chickens, sorry, uh, the relationship between proteins and amino acids. Let's just basically look at the context of proteins uh, for the use in humans, okay? We understand that every living organism needs proteins, but to make things a bit simpler for now, we want to talk first about uh, why humans need proteins. Like I said earlier, when you studied it in, before A-levels, your pre-A-level years, you may have been told that proteins are needed to build muscles and to repair tissues. But what is a protein? Anything can be a protein in your body, by the way. For example, your hair. Your hair is actually made up of proteins called keratin. Your skin actually contains a protein called collagen, which gives it its elasticity, its flexibility. If you remember, when you studied saliva, saliva in our mouth contains something known as amylase enzymes. And those amylase enzymes needed to digest starch are also made out of proteins. Other examples of proteins that you might think of is a red blood cells. Red blood cells themselves are not proteins, but red blood cells contain very important proteins called hemoglobin, which helps to carry oxygen. Uh, our muscles contain something called contractile protein, actin and myosin. We are only going to be looking at actin and myosin in chapter 16 in A2. So that's a long way off. Um, so... As we can see over here, we have different types of proteins that carry out different functions. Some proteins are needed to form hair, some strengthens our skin, some carries oxygen, some moves the muscle, some digests food. And you might be thinking, oh wow, that so proteins can do a lot of things. Yeah, proteins can basically do a lot of things because there are many different, there is a diverse uh, cornucopia, if I may, of proteins when it comes to their structure and their functions. And how is it possible? How can we have so many different types of protein? Well, before we go into that in detail, again, do you have to know all the proteins in existence? No. You do not have to know all the proteins in existence. However, it is very important to know some important proteins in the human body. Uh, we'll have to know hemoglobin we will uh, and hemoglobin is going to be talked about in chapter 8 enzymes in chapter 4 is it chapter 4 
I think enzymes is in chapter 4. I always get those two confused. I think enzymes, no, enzymes are in chapter 3. Yeah, chapter 3. We have to know a little bit about collagen. We will be talking about collagen later in later videos for chapter 2. We have to talk a little bit about hormones, uh, insulin and glucagon. This will be in chapter 14. Antibodies in chapter 11. So you don't have to know all the proteins right from the get-go. We will be introducing different types of proteins in different chapters. All right. So looking at all this list right here, you may be thinking, oh, wow, there's so many different types of proteins that we have to cover. So it may be overwhelming, but let's start from the basics. Now, if you remember at the beginning part of the video, I did say that to build proteins, you need something known as amino acids. So amino acids are basically the building blocks or subunits or monomers required to build or to make proteins. I like to use an analogy where I say that amino acids come in a myriad of Lego blocks. So if I were to just basically show you this picture over here, as you can see, there are many different types of Lego blocks, okay, of varying uh, shapes and sizes, okay. And the beautiful thing is when you take these Lego blocks and when you join these Lego blocks in many different ways, you get many different models. Same thing goes with amino acids as well. When you join the amino acids in many different ways, you get a myriad or a diversity of proteins. That's how you're able to get collagen, keratin, hemoglobin, amylase, uh, even though they all came from the basic building blocks of amino acids. So without wasting any time, let's basically go into the structure of amino acids. What you have to know about amino acids are in nature, there are 20 different types of amino acids. Now, of course, as a student, you may think, oh God, do I have to memorize all these 20 different types of amino acids? No, you do not need to memorize those 20 different types of amino acids. And immediately, I think there is a sigh of relief, like, oh, thank God. Okay. Now, so... Um, and no matter what type of amino acid it is, they all have the same basic structure, all 20 types. All amino acids will have, I'm just going to draw a C over here, carbon, and I'm going to put it in blue, as you can see on the right hand side, a carboxylic acid group. And the carboxylic acid group is C double bond O, O, H. The next group that they also will have is the amine group on the left hand side. Uh, I'm drawing it on the left, uh, which I'm drawing it in purple. I guess that's purple, yeah. Uh, and the MN group is made up of NH2. And they also have something called the R group, also referred to as the side chain. And these are the three basic groups that all amino acids must have. Now, some students will ask me, does the MN group have to be on the left and does the carboxylic acid group have to be on the right? Uh, not, not necessarily. They have to be... Um, parallel to each other though. So like for example, uh, the C, the carboxylic acid group can be on the left, the amine group can be on the right. Uh, that, that's fine too. As long as they're parallel to each other, you're, you're drawing uh, the correct amino acid. And what is also important to know is the R group has to be perpendicular or at 90 degrees to the carboxylic acid group and the amine group. That's important to note. Now, what makes amino acids different from each other? So, I told you just now that there are 20 different types of amino acids. And what makes the amino acids different from each other is the R group. The R group is variable for different types of amino acids. So, what does that mean? Let's look at it in detail. I'm going to draw out three amino acids for you. Alanine, in bracket ALA, glycine, GLY and also serin, S-E-R. We are going to draw the C-H bonds first. That's the basic structure you must always draw. Now let's draw it together, okay? The next group I always like to put is the carboxylic acid group, C-O-O-H. Notice that for alanine, glycine, and serin, so far everything's exactly the same. The carboxylic acid group is the same. Next, we do the amine group, and H 2 It's the same for all three amino acids again. What makes them different, however, is their R group. For alanine, the R group is made up of CH3. For glycine, however, there's just a hydrogen in the R group. For serine, however, there is a 
CH2OH group. And I'm going to highlight the R groups to show how they are different from each other. So alanine, glycine, and serine have the same carboxylic acid group, the same amine group. However, they have different R groups. That's what makes one amino acid different from another amino acid. Again, do you have to memorize each of the different R groups? The answer is no, you don't have to. The only thing you have to know, however, is glycine is referred to as the smallest amino acid amongst all the 20 different types. It only has a hydrogen in its R group. That's all we have to know. So we have seen three different types of amino acids. And what makes one amino acid di different from another amino acid is the R group. That's basically it.